Now, uh, now, this past week, um, we were a bit, uh, maybe taken a bit off guard. We didn't quite, um, maybe you haven't known how to quite process some of the news that we received just with the, the shooting that took place in Nashville. And I mean, it's just a, a terrible, terrible thing that took place there in which you had um, someone go into a, a Christian school and it was there that three children lost their lives, three adults lost their lives. And um, and it's just, it's just awful. It's evil. It was horrific. And as you maybe are trying to answer or find answers to questions you have with, when tragedies like this take place, um, we just finished up a series on Job. We spent five weeks basically talking about things like that. And I'd encourage you to go check out those, um, those sermons, those messages to get some perspective on tragedy in life and how we can understand the tragedy and the suffering that often takes place. But, but one, one point of view that I want to offer you today that, that would be a different than what you would hear from those sermons is this, is you have this, this, this woman who goes into this school who has a mission, has a purpose, and it's an incredibly evil and, again, horrific mission and purpose, but they are doing this in order to further uh, some kind of agenda that they have, and they, they are, in their way, doing something to help people that they would say are misunderstood, to help people who are marginalized, to help people who are hurt, and so then they're going to go and they're going to take life to do that. And I want to contrast that with Jesus, who in a similar sense came into this world with a purpose. He came into this world with a mission. He came into this world to help people who were misunderstood, to help people who were confused, to help people who were lost, to help people who were hurting. But the reason that Jesus' way is always, always so much better, and one of the reasons why we need to proclaim the message of the gospel, and we need to tell people about Jesus, and you need to bring people to be a part of Easter weekend, and you need to let people know about your faith. This is why. Because you have somebody here who did not take life to further his mission and purpose and to change the world. Instead, he is a man who gave his life. He gave his life to make a difference. He gave his life to change the world. He gave his life to help people and to ultimately allow us to be where we're at today. And that is why Jesus' way is still moving forward. And that, and that is just awful. That's just terrible. And there's no words that can completely adequ adequately explain what happened there with that shooting. But what I am saying is I want to contrast that with Jesus who offers us such a better path and a better story in life. And that's something we need to grab a hold of. And that's something, again, that our world desperately, desperately needs. So I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message today. So let's do that. Father, uh, we come before you and we come before you specifically with uh, the heaviness of that situation that took place this past week. And um, and Lord, again, you know, there aren't words that can adequately explain what happened, and we can't fully understand it. But Father, we know that, that you're surrounding those who are hurt by that. You're surrounding those that perhaps are affected by that, even, even at a distance. And, and so, Lord, um, we pray for your hand to be upon that school, to be upon those people, those families that have lost loved ones. And, and Father, may we again just continue to proclaim your gospel message, proclaim and lift up your son, because because we know how much of a difference that truly does make in this world. And whenever that message is pushed forth, Lord, things like this, they're less and they happen less and less. And we believe that, and we trust ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, um, this time of year is March Madness, and with the March Madness, we often focus on the men's side of the basketball tournament, and it's been a rather crazy and unusual year with that, with teams that nobody would have expected to make it to the Final Four, and then we got this championship game that nobody really saw coming. But what's, all, but what's been interesting to me is what's happening even on the, it's happening on the women's side. Now, our, I, I particularly was piqued the interest of Iowa, and a specific player on Iowa's basketball team named Caitlin Clark. And, and I was a little bit familiar with her, but I had no idea how good she actually was until I saw the Elite Eight game that she played in. She was playing Iowa uh, on Iowa against the Louisville Cardinals, and we are from Louisville primarily, and I have two kids that were born in Louisville, and so while we primarily uh, follow the University of Kentucky, 
but uh, we do keep up a little bit with the Louisville Cardinals. And so we were keeping up with that game. And it was just unbelievable to see this girl score 41 points on Louisville, who was a really good basketball team, and they've got a great coach. And then she has 12 assists and 10 rebounds. You just don't see something like that happen normally, where somebody can have a 40-point game, and then they still get the triple-double. It's just very unusual. So then people, the news media, specifically ESPN, talking about that throughout the week. And then they've got South Carolina that they just played. And South Carolina has won like seven. 700 games in a row, and they've got these girls that are just insanely tough, and they just would whip me all over the court for sure. And, and they got one girl at six foot seven, and I mean, and they, and I can't say it again, they are tough. Like, they are physical, they are an incredibly physical team. And everybody knew that Caitlin Clark going into that game was going to get the ball, she was going to shoot the ball, she was going to make the shots that she was shooting, and they still couldn't stop her. The best team in the country. Couldn't do anything with her. She scores another 41 points. She didn't quite get the triple-double, but got close to it. And, I just, and everybody just sort of steps back and says, man, this girl is great. And indeed, she is great. She's going to be, without a doubt, one of the greatest women's college basketball players ever. I'm sure there can be some arguments made, especially if they win the national championship, that she is the greatest. But the reason I bring that up is because when we see greatness in athletics, we, we pretty much know what it is. And when we see greatness in other areas, like academia, we pretty much know what that is. When we see greatness in a field or a sector that we're familiar with or that we work in, we know what exactly that is. But when it comes to the life that we live, and specifically the Christian life that if you're a believer in Christ are called to live, that level of greatness is a little bit harder for us to define, a little bit more difficult for us to figure out. Now the world, now the world will offer us a story of what greatness is, and it generally revolves around two things. And those two things are stuff and status. It's stuff, it's, and that stuff can vary depending on each of us. It can be clothes, it can be shoes, it can obviously be houses and cars and other stuff like that. The, the, the world is going to stay, if you, if you can have that stuff, then you're going to have a great life. The world, the definition I would say around us of of status is about recognition. It's about likes and views and the number of people that maybe serve you and look up to you and perhaps it's about positions that you're able to attain and letters after your name. It's again about status. That's the story the world offers. And as Christians, we wonder, maybe you do, I know I have, is it even appropriate to want to live a great life? Is it appropriate to want to have greatness in our lives? And what I want to present to you today is this, is that it absolutely is. And that you are called to live a great life. And your life is meant to have a great story to it. And we are meant to be a great community of faith. This is meant to be a great community of faith that, that is helping, each one, helping one another, journeying with one another, making a difference in our community. We are meant to have that kind of a, we are meant to be that kind of a great church. And you are meant to have that kind of a great life. But the story of greatness that Jesus offers is much different than the story of greatness that the world offers. And because we don't fully understand this, and maybe we aren't compelled by by it or, or it isn't riveting enough for us, we, we settle. Christians settle for the story of stuff and status and we just figure, well, God will just figure it out in the end. But God has something better for us. And that's what we're going to talk about today is what exactly does it look like to live that great life? The great life that God would be calling you to live and the greatness that he is calling our community of faith to have. Well, the struggle that we have, at least I have, is the same struggle that the disciples had. And there are specific verses in which they came to Jesus very directly and at times even indirectly and were asking him about what does it mean to be great in your kingdom? Specifically, jumping into Luke chapter nine, this is what it says there. A dispute arose amongst them, being the disciples, as to which of them would be considered the greatest. And And this is why this is so relevant. Jesus doesn't say, Well, you shouldn't even be considering greatness and you shouldn't be pursuing greatness. You shouldn't even think about greatness. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, this is what greatness really is. And he talks about a child. And he says, the least among you, that's who will be the greatest. So the disciples journey along with them a little bit longer. We aren't exactly sure how much longer it is that that they journey with Jesus. But then there comes this point in which the greatness topic comes up again. But they learned the first time not to necessarily bring up themselves personally. Instead, they say, theoretically speaking, okay, Matthew chapter 18. Who 
is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who, Jesus? I mean, if you just consider your kingdom, you've been talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We don't really understand the difference between the two. It seems like they're the same, but we know that'll get sorted out later on. But what we're really worried about is who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? And Jesus gives a similar response that he gave before. You know, the servant, the servant is the one who's the greatest. And then uh, James and John, uh, the sons of Zebedee, they still weren't completely satisfied with what Jesus had to say. And so it seems as though they coerced their mom to go to Jesus. And she asked Jesus, okay, can my sons, James and John, you know, those guys that are kind of in your inner circle that you really like a lot, and this one that, that you really love, or at least he says you're going to love them a lot. If you ever read the Gospel of John, that's, that's how he describes himself. At any rate, can they sit at your left and your right? And then Jesus says, you know what? You don't even, I love you. He's very gentle with her. You don't even know what you're asking. And it's not even me to grant that, first of all. Who's going to sit on my left and my right? But you don't really know what greatness is really all about. And that's, and that's where we come to in John chapter 13. And it's here that Jesus is going to teach us a lesson on true greatness. But it's not going to be a teaching lesson. It's going to be an object lesson, a rather unusual object lesson, the kind of object lesson that nobody really saw coming. Because while the disciples are arguing about who would have the highest position, Jesus quietly takes the lowest position. And that's where we pick up in John chapter 13, and we'll read through several of the verses here at the beginning of this chapter. It was just before the Passover festival, and they're in the supper room. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to, to leave this world and go to the Father. His time had come. Now, whenever you hear somebody say, your time has come, usually something good follows that, doesn't it? Usually, whenever your time has come, you've gotten the promotion. You got the promotion because your time finally came. You put in the time, you put in the effort, you put in the years of work, you respected a boss who didn't respect you, you outperformed peers who were trying to outperform you. Your time came, so you got the promotion. Or maybe you've been struggling through maybe infertility for quite a while, maybe even years, but you're pregnant now because your time finally came. Or maybe you just got engaged or you just got married and you spent so many years pursuing the Lord and following after him and growing in your character. And then your time finally came. Jesus' time comes, but it doesn't come in a respect in the same way that we would think his time would come. Because from a worldly standpoint, it doesn't seem all that good. But from a heavenly standpoint, it's going to be divine. And this is where we first see catch a glimpse of Christ's greatness. Because Christ's greatness is found in his suffering. When it says his time came, it means that the time for suffering had come for him. There have been others that had wanted to take him, to kill him, to hurt him, but the Bible tells us again and again throughout the Gospels, his time had not come, his time had not come, his time had not come, but now his time had finally come. Come for what? His time had come for him to be betrayed by those that were close, to, by someone who was close to him. To be rejected by his own people as they would choose Barabbas over him. To face the sham of a trial before the Sanhedrin. To be flogged, which is the type of pain that we can't even, we cannot even imagine what that would feel like. And he went through that. To be mocked and have a crown of thorns pressed upon his head, blood coming down his face. And then ultimately to be taken to Calvary where he'd be nailed to a cross and he'd be left there to die. That's the kind of suffering that Jesus went through. And it's interesting from our vantage point, we don't often think about greatness being attached to suffering, but in Jesus's story, it absolutely is. And in a sense, when we suffer for the Lord, we're tapping into the greatness of the story that God has for us. It's like a man I know who was a Muslim and he came to faith in Christ. And his family rejected him. They disowned him, actually. 
He didn't have anywhere to live. He didn't have any money to support himself. And a community of faith that was in the church that he was in came around him, and they helped him, and they guided him along, and they supported him on that journey. But that story of his, it had suffering from a worldly standpoint, but it was glory from a divine standpoint. It's those moments I have periodically where I'll be talking to somebody, and maybe I'll mention my faith, or I'll tell them I'm a pastor of a church, and And then the conversation gets short, the conversation gets awkward, they think it's really weird, they don't understand. I know I only work one day a week, but I I can make it work, we make it work. They know, at any rate, you know, it gets gets a little odd, off, and there's just a tinge of that suffering. And we, we're called to that. And there's truly greatness in that. Like that path that God has for you is going to be marked by those moments. And in much, much lesser sense, but a very true sense. It's that moment whenever you say, you know, we, we didn't, we missed church last Sunday. We've got this opportunity to go ski this next weekend. But because we missed church, we're not going to go ski. Now the world would say, ah, you know, that's silly. That's, that's not very smart. You should take advantage of that. But you're going to suffer from a worldly standpoint because you know that that's where you need to be from a divine standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint. That, that's the kind of suffering that I'm talking about. It's like, um, it's like one of our elders, I, sh- I shouldn't say his name, Eric Mendelin. Um, <laughs> he, his family's given these tickets, it was a couple years ago, to be in a box at, a, I believe it was a Nuggets game. And you know, I mean, that's off, I mean, that's like heaven to me. You know, you go in there, you get to eat all the food and have all the drinks and just hang out and enjoy yourself. It's completely ra- relaxed, it's very refreshing. When on this particular night they were given those tickets, we had a prayer and worship night here at the church. And so his family said, you know what? They did some assessing and they just said, you know what? We need to be at the prayer and worship night. And they turned down, passed on those tickets. Now, from a worldly standpoint, there's a little bit of suffering there. The world people around you might say, neighbors of yours, coworkers would say, family members would say, what is wrong with you? Why would you pass up on that? But from a spiritual standpoint, it's like that, that's what walking and journeying with Christ is going to be marked by. It's going to be marked by kind of crucifying some of those things to kind of live for yourself. Not to live for yourself, but to live for him. I mean, and, and I would even say, you know, I'll, I'm a bit embarrassed I would say this, but I'll, I'll be honest, I've had these thoughts. I can't, I can't remember being 33, 32, 34. We hadn't bought it. We didn't buy a house until we were 35. But I can remember being 32, 33, 34, and, and not knowing how we would ever buy a home or when that would happen. And I'm stringing out the, you know, I'm looking at my budget, and I'm looking at the money we're saving, and I'm stringing out the years it's going to take to get to where we need to get to, to put down a down payment. And, and I started to think, wow, you know, if we hadn't given all that money to the church, because we've always given a tithe and more to our church, we've always done that. If we hadn't given all, those, all that money to the church or to the Lord, then we would have already been able to buy a house. I wouldn't be driving a car that's like 15 years old or whatever it was. That's what this journey is all about. As we journey with Christ, there's a little bit of suffering. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But from a divine, spiritual standpoint, there is glory. And so Christ's greatness is found in his suffering. His time had finally come. But nobody really understood. And so he's going to teach them this lesson. And the text goes on, verse 2. The evening meal was in progress. They were in the upper room. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. This is an important detail that, that I think maybe you need to be aware of, especially if you dealt with like childhood trauma or even adulthood trauma for that matter. Here's this person that Jesus loved. He was, in his, uh, he was a confidant. He was somewhat of a close inner circle of Jesus. He was the guy that managed the money. Jesus had invested years in him. And he's going to betray him. And what's interesting and intriguing about that to me is this, is that here's this person that is going to hurt Jesus so deeply or lead to his suffering by the decisions that he's, lead Jesus to suffer by the decisions that he's going to make. And it, it didn't keep Jesus from fulfilling his purpose it didn't keep Jesus 
from ultimately experiencing the greatness that, that we know Jesus ultimately would experience, the glory that he would experience. It wasn't even a bump in the road. It was a necessary part of the story that God was writing here as salvation would come into the world. And the lesson here is this, is that maybe you struggle with some stuff like that. Maybe you had parents who abused you, or maybe you dealt with some neglect as a child, or maybe you're kind of the one child that was forgotten in the midst of other kids, or maybe you're the one that hasn't been able to quite catch a break at work, or maybe you had some false allegations thrown up against you. Or I, I don't know what the situation is for you, but what I'm trying to tell you is, is that you can't look at it as a in, your, in the story that God's writing in your life and the great path that he's taking you down, you can't look at that and say, oh, that's the thing that's gonna hold me back. That's the thing that's gonna keep me from getting to where I need to get to. No, God takes a hold of those things. He redeems those things and they don't become a bump in the road. They become a necessary part of the story to get you down the path that God has for you. And often, often, it's even the people that we love who do that to us. And the text then goes on. Verse four. So Jesus, he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And so he, he, he gets into this service, this service position. Verse five. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. In this culture, you know, closed-toed shoes wasn't a thing. Sandals were you know, probably even somewhat rare of a thing. That was at best the situation. So everybody's feet are dirty, they're grimy, they're filthy. I mean, even in our world today, you may not realize this, but the amount of like germs and bacteria that we track into our homes is unbelievable with our shoes. But in this culture, it was even worse. And so the lowest of the low servants, one of them would be at the front door or at the door that you would walk into whatever residence you're walking into, and that person would have the towel around the waist, they would have the water the basin, in the basin, and they would begin to wash your feet. Well, that person wasn't there. And so rather than one of the disciples stepping up to the occasion, meeting the need of the situation, that didn't happen, and so what does Jesus do? Jesus, again, while they're arguing about who would have the highest position, he takes the lowest position. And he begins to serve them and help them and washes their feet. The one person that shouldn't have been doing it was doing it. Here's the second thing about greatness with Christ, is Christ's greatness is found in service. It's, it's always found in service. Going on there, verse six. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet too? I mean, Simon is thinking to himself, geez, I messed this up. You, you've had those moments <laughs> where somebody does something, you're thinking, crap, I should have done that. Dang it, I should have said that. I should have helped out. I should have given, I should have... I should have paid for their meal. Uh, the person in front of you in line, you know what I'm saying? They don't have enough money to pay for it. The credit card isn't going through. They forget the credit card, whatever. You should step in, you don't. I should step in, I don't. Somebody else behind us, like five people back, steps in and does it. And we're thinking, oh, I should have done that. That's what Peter's thinking here. Lord, you're gonna wash my feet. We, we've been in the process of actually hiring here at the church and, and I'll get information about that to you in the, in the coming week and weeks. But as we talk with people that we want to hire at the church, one of the things, well, a few of the things that we talk to them about is like we want to hire people who work hard. We want to hire people who have character. We want to hire people who have a strong faith. We also want to hire people who have a servant's heart. Because whenever you work at a church, you just inevitably do things that are not a part of your job, like shoveling the snow on a sidewalk or lifting up heavy packages that are left out in front of the office or you're stacking chairs during the week or you're picking up paper that's in the hallway. So you just gotta have a servant's heart because if you don't have the servant heart, you're just gonna get angry and frustrated and be bitter about all the random things you gotta do. That's just part of the deal. And so Jesus is teaching them that lesson and he gets on his feet, he's wash, he gets on his knees, he's washing Simon Peter's feet and Jesus replied to him, now this is, this is what I love. You don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. Peter, you don't fully appreciate what it is that I'm doing. Peter, you're not grateful for what I'm doing. You don't, you don't even understand what I'm doing. Later, you'll figure it out. But right now, you, you have, there's no appreciation or gratitude. How many times in our lives do we not do what we should do? Or are we bitter about what we did do? Because somebody didn't understand. Because somebody wasn't grateful. They weren't appreciative. 
too often. We'll shovel the snow, we'll pay for the bill, we'll help our kid out, we'll help our neighbor out, we'll help our mom out, our mom or dad will help us out. Whatever the situation, I mean, it's all the variety of, we string out those scenarios endlessly. And we want appreciation, we want gratitude. And because we didn't get it the last time, we aren't gonna do it the next time, even if it's somebody different. And what Jesus is showing us here is that the Christian, the Christian faith is marked by serving without any gratitude. Like if you wanna really be great and do the things that God's calling you to do, more often than not, there is gonna be no gratitude and no appreciation for that. Maybe you'll get a little bit of it along the way. But that path of greatness, it is gonna be marked by people not understanding why you do what you do, and maybe even not even knowing that you're doing what it is that you are doing. And some of you husbands, I mean, I've been there, I've had those moments. I'll just say what I say. She doesn't understand what I do for the family. I'm providing for the family. I'm like dragging this trash can out in a foot of snow. They don't, they don't appreciate me. And they don't. <laughs> just the truth. They, just, they don't. They, they genuinely do not appreciate you. They, they have no interest in helping you get that trash can out, drag through all that snow. And they're just glad you're doing it, and it's not them, and that's about as much as you're going to get. They just don't appreciate you. And you women, you wives, he doesn't appreciate all that I do. I'm up in the middle of the night. I'm making like 20 meals a week. I'm like barely able to leave, you know, you're saying like, I'm barely able to leave the kitchen. I'm making so many meals. I'm cleaning the dishes. I'm making sure they get the bath, their baths. I'm helping them with their homework, and he's out on a hunting trip. He's hunting right now, and then you're scrubbing the dishes, and you're just, he didn't appreciate me. And to, to be fair, there are many times we don't do that, and we should. Man, that's the path, Christ's path, the greatness. It is marked by these moments, so many moments, where we're just like Jesus. You don't even realize now what I'm doing. Maybe down the road you'll understand, maybe you won't, but... That's what we're called to. And so Peter says, no, no, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You're going to have no part with me. And it's there that maybe there's this understanding at a deeper level that Jesus is actually talking not just about service, but he's talking about forgiveness. And so Peter responds, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Father, just Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, Pour your, pour, wash all of me. I am, I am filthy, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said this. Those who have had a bath now need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean though not every one of you, referring to Judas. Pick up verse 11. For he knew who was going to betray him and that is why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, you call me great. You call me great. And rightly so. For that, I mean, indeed, I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant's greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed. You will be blessed if you do them. And it's from here shortly after this that Jesus would be betrayed, that he would again go through the sham of a trial, that he would be rejected by his people, that he would be flogged, and that he would ultimately, that he would ultimately go to a cross, and it's there that he would sacrifice himself. John chapter 19 says it this way. As he hung on the cross, Jesus, knowing that all now was finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst and a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and they held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. The Greek phrase there is tetelestai. And he bowed his head and he gave up his, he gave up his spirit. 
And what is it exactly that's finished? It's not entirely this act of salvation. That, that actually is going to become fully available to us once Jesus rises from the grave. What he's saying is finished here is the sacrificial system. What he's saying is finished here is that you don't have to earn your way into heaven anymore. You don't have to sacrifice. You don't have to do certain things to get yourself right with God. You don't have to desire stuff and you don't have to desire status anymore. It is finished. And I'm going to give you a different path. I'm going to give you a better path. In Christ's Christ's greatness, then we are taught here, is found in his sacrifice. It's a dying to ourselves that we truly get to experience greatness. In in the ancient times, if you were to have some kind of a criminal offense, um, you would be given a, a record of your account. It was called your indebtedness. And so what you would do, and I'm saying this to help us better understand and appreciate what it is that we have in Christ. So what you would do if you were to be in any kind of trouble, you would have to bring your criminal record to the judge because, you know, they didn't have like this intricate filing system in which Thessalonica could communicate with Philippi. It just didn't work like that. They didn't have Google where they could just check out your name and your record and all that. None of that stuff existed. So you had to bring it to the judge, and the judge would look at it, and then he would assess what you did versus what you've done, and then he would give you some sort of a sentence. Well, Paul is going to use, Paul is using that, uh, he's using that, that, that context, that system that was in place to teach all of us what it is that Jesus has done for us. And he says this in Colossians 2. He forgave us all our sins. He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And when he nailed it to the cross, there was blood that came down his hands. And so what he's saying is this, is that our legal, our spiritual indebtedness to God was placed in Jesus' hands and it was nailed to the cross and his blood has covered over that indebtedness, all over that criminal record, that, 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 that rap sheet of ours. And then when we come before the judge and we hand him, that history of our our indebtedness, our criminal record, our wrongdoings, our mistakes, the judge looks at that and he doesn't see any longer how you or I have ever fallen short. Instead, he only sees the blood of Jesus that is poured over. Yep, yep, amen. That is poured over all of the indebtedness and those moments of falling short that we have in our lives. And that's what we have in Jesus, the innocent lamb, in that he received what we deserve and now we receive what it is that he deserves, which is an eternity with our heavenly father. It's a past that's forgiven, it's a purpose for living and it's a place in heaven. And so now we're gonna have a time of communion to reflect on that. And we're going to use this to propel us forward to next weekend, which is Easter weekend. And the story is going to stop here. It's going to stop now where Jesus died. He has been buried. And we are going to reflect on that sacrifice. If you didn't receive communion when you came in, our team will be happy to bring that to you now. Just raise your hand and they'll walk that up to you. But it's in the juice that you can reflect on the blood that was shed for you to cover over your sins. It's with that little cracker, that bread there, that you can reflect on his body that was torn to make you right with God. And it's in this time that you can be grateful because now you finally understand. You didn't before, but now you do. You can finally be grateful for the love, the love that God has for you. That he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son that who shall ever believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And so let's take a few moments just now to reflect on that. I'm gonna say a prayer for us and then in a, shortly after that, Logan will lead us in worship. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for what you've given us in Jesus. We're grateful for the great path that you have shown us that is found in him. And it's on that path that there is a story that is so much better than the one that the world offers us. And so Father, I pray that we would take a step, we would take steps, that we'd lean into that direction, that way, and not our own. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you've given us in Jesus, the love that you displayed for us on that cross. And we praise you for that. And we give you all this in his name. Amen.